people are excited because, uh, like, it's warm and sunshine, and I know that uh, we get excited. But uh, yesterday reminded me that one of the things that when it gets nice and pretty outside, that also means that it's time for work and also hard work. So I spent uh, a lot of time on the tractor yesterday and uh, mowing uh, with a different lawnmower because last week I shared with you that our existing lawnmower uh, bursted in flames, and so now I'm using the tractor to mow with. But anyway, the nice weather also means that there's, there's work, and we like that because we like being outside. And this time of year, it's just some of my favorite because... Um, there's all these farms that are near us, and you see all these little lambs and, and goats. And uh, like at our house, we've got some baby chicks, and uh, it's just it's just a time of year what that what that is. And April is so neat about that because uh, we're also taking this time to celebrate Easter. And I know that uh, Easter means something completely different to uh, to all of you. And I know that we've all had different backgrounds uh, and upbringings where Easter may have been a big deal or maybe it may not have been a big deal. And uh, Easter in our house has always been made a big deal. And we usually always had to wear what we call church shoes. Uh, church shoes is shoes that you only wear to church. And uh, for kids, I know that you know what that, what that means. Uh, and we would wear church socks. I know uh, there was some of the things that surrounded Easter because we'd always have an Easter outfit and maybe you're already, you know, looking for an Easter outfit or whatever. Uh, we don't make it that big of a deal as far as that the outfit goes in, in our house. But I know that commercials and everything play Easter to be one certain area. And they're all, all about like an Easter outfit or Easter dress. Or the one thing that I am a fan of is the Reese's um, peanut butter eggs. Uh, they only come out around Easter time and I'm a big fan of those. And my birthday was a few weeks ago and I got two big packs of those for my birthday. So there, there's cool things about that. But it has nothing to do uh, with actually what Easter is. And I don't know what Easter may mean to you. Like, whenever you think of Easter, what that, what memories may come back uh, to you. And I, for me, it's, uh, it's usually getting up early on the Easter morning. And uh, I remember our parents would get us up and they'd take us to a graveyard and have a sunrise service. And uh, <laughs> it just, it never was fun because uh, mom and dad would come and get us up. And I was like, all right, get up. It's dark outside. We're going to the graveyard. And, uh, like, no kid ever looks forward to that. I just remember being terrified just holding on to my dad because it's dark outside and it's a graveyard. Uh, but anyway, we did that, and that's one of the things that sticks out in my mind. And I don't know what may stick out in your mind about Easter, but what we're going to do this month is that we're going to like look at all the events surrounding Easter, um, things leading up to it and then afterwards, and then what they mean to us today so we can have a good understanding of like the flow of what took place the last week of Jesus' life and what it means to us. And I think it's so important because we may have the wrong idea of Easter, our own misconception. But I think that as you like, we look at this, I think you're going to have maybe a new uh, identity of what Easter may mean and also maybe a different relationship with Jesus because it's, it really is huge. So if you have your Bibles and if you can turn with me to Luke uh, chapter 19, this is a, it's an amazing story. And this, this event we're talking about today is known as the entry. This kicks off what's known as Holy Week. Uh, and Holy Week, all it is, is the last week of Jesus' life. But leading up to his entry into Jerusalem, and the events taking place that week, and then, of course, his death, and then we celebrate Easter on his resurrection. We're just going to look at these events that took place all throughout this week, known as Holy Week, and then what they, what they mean to us today. And all this is surrounding Easter. And uh, I asked the guys that would just leave the lights off because I just want to try to make this as intimate as possible. Uh, just so that you can kind of see Jesus for maybe for what who he is. Because sometimes we get caught up in people. We can get caught up in the other people around us instead of focusing on our relationship with Jesus. This is what you're getting ready to see here. This is Luke chapter 19. And uh, this is pretty amazing. So Luke chapter 19 starts at verse 28. And it says, uh, When he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany, at the place called Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples. And this is pretty important right here because what's happening is that Jesus is leading the disciples. He's leading his disciples up all over to this point to the Mount of Olives. And then he's sending two of his disciples on. He gives them further instruction. But he's, he's leading them. And see, if we have a relationship with Jesus, he's going to be leading us. And I think that we often get this backwards. We get this confused thinking that we're the ones who lives at our lives, but it's actually he's the one who's leading us and guiding us if we'll just surrender. Hey, just, Jesus, what do you want from me today? What, what do you want from me today? 
It doesn't mean that we're always going to get it wrong because you will mess up. Some of you messed up this morning. Some of you are going to mess up this week. And it may be, in some people's eyes, a huge mess up or it may be a small mess up. I don't think that that's what we need to be focusing on. The focus is, is who it is that's leading us. Because we know these disciples, we know that they've messed up a lot. We know that Peter's getting ready to mess up. He's going to even mess up that he even knows Jesus. He's going to actually curse and say, I don't know the man. All a part of Holy Week. Peter messed. He messed up. And you're messing up. You're going to mess up. And it's all because we live in this sin-filled world. But what the main point of it is, is who it is that's leading us. Is it you leading your life or is it Jesus? Now, we get into also a different idea about what that means too about making that Jesus be the Lord of our life, allowing Jesus to lead us and guide us. And what we often get this idea of maybe uh, street preachers or maybe get the idea that we just need to go around and it's just everything is just, it's just Jesus. You're just going around and just saying Jesus and maybe you're going up to the uh, checkout line and you're just saying, you know, bless you or just... It's not that we do any of that. It's not, some people are also refer to it as Bible thumpers, that you're just, it's just Jesus all the time. And believe it or not, I like to talk about other stuff too. Like, I love talking about the Bible and Jesus. Like, I love that. But I love talking about dogs and cars and trucks and tractors, as long as we're Macy Ferguson's. And I like talking about my kids. Like, we can talk about other stuff. But it's almost like when people say, oh, you go to church, it's almost like they will transform, especially if you know you're a leader or, or you're a pastor. And it's just like they turn into something else and they start using great big words. And church, None of that has anything to do with this. And you don't see any of that in this. The only thing that you see is that Jesus is leading these disciples. That's it. He's leading them. You will see later on that they even go fishing. We can enjoy our life here. We can enjoy things here. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just that the one who's leading us is Jesus. That's it. Who is it that's leading you in your life? Like, do you have a relationship with Jesus right now? Like, is he, is he leading you? Now, I didn't ask, are you perfect? I didn't ask if you always get it right because I don't always get it right. Sometimes I think I do. And I guarantee you that you fall into that same boat too that you often think that you're right. Uh, I have, uh, we have four girls and uh, one of them, uh, she thinks she's right most of the time. And I'm not going to say her name or embarrass her, but she thinks she's right all the time. And she said this to Amanda the other day. She said, I know that I'm right. And I believe that when we get to heaven, you're going to realize just how right I am. <laughs> it's in. Is that not hilarious? But we are the same. Like, it's ingrained in us that we want to be right. We want to be right. And then when we find out that we're wrong, we feel guilty. We feel, feel ashamed. We feel embarrassed. It, it, it's, it's okay not to get things right. I think that the main thing is here is that we allow Jesus to lead us. And if he's leading us in a direction, that's where we need to go. That's the main thing. Because you're going to mess up. You're going to mess up in your marriage. You're going to mess up on your birthdays. You're going to mess up raising your kids. You're going to mess up. You're going to make mistakes. I think mistakes are okay. As long as we don't repeat those mistakes. We're going to learn from them. And then next, because there's a lot of things that I know that I'm not going to do next time. I, I'm not going to do. Uh, I was shared with you a few months ago that I learned that I am never going to hold a nail again for one of my kids while they hammer. I'll never do that again. They can hold the nail while they hammer. They can smash their own thumb. They're not going to smash mine again because that baby hurts. I'm not going to make those mistakes again. And I think that's what this main thing is, that Jesus is the one who's leading us. He's leading us. And he sends these two disciples. And he's leading everybody up to this point of Mount Olives, and he sends these two disciples. He gives them some further instruction. Look at this. It says, so he sent two of the disciples. This is verse 30. And he said, go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a young donkey tied there, which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you are untying it, say this, the Lord needs it. Now, how would you like to be these other two disciples? We don't know who they are, but he's sending them on to go find this donkey. And he says, hey, you're going to go on into the village, find this donkey and bring it back. Now, if I was these disciples, I would have questions like, okay, Jesus, uh, who do they belong to? I need like some sort of permission slip. You know, can you sign something? Can you just say, you know, sign, you know, Jesus, like something so that I won't get caught for stealing or trying to take another man's 
uh, you know, donkey or something like that. But no, he says, hey, if anybody asks, just say the Lord needs it. Doesn't that seem kind of crazy? It would be the equivalent today of us going and, and getting in somebody's car with the keys already and say, hey, you're going to go on ahead and you're going to find, you know, this nice car there. The keys are in it. If anybody asks, just say the Lord needs it. Like, does that not sound ridiculous? Because they didn't have, you know, Yukons and all this stuff back then. They had donkeys and they had horses. I mean, that's what they traveled by. So it would be the equivalent of a, a, a vehicle today. But this one is a special one because no one had ever rode in this one. So this would be the equivalent of a brand new car. It still had the new car smell. In this case, the brand new donkey smell. And he said, if anybody asks why you're untying it, just say, the Lord needs it. And we need to use some caution here. That we don't use the name of the Lord for our own agenda. Because this happens. That we'll want something and we'll justify it by saying, oh, the Lord wants me to do this. See, we almost made this mistake uh, in our lives probably about 10, 12 years ago, thinking that we were going to buy this new car. And it's just like we were going to buy this new car and it was going to be expensive. And we started seeing them everywhere. And Amanda's like, it must be a sign. And I just wasn't feeling it. And we fit like cats and dogs over this ridiculous car. And it was nothing special. But it was a 2004 Chevrolet Impala. And it was brand new. And it was, the car never looks as new and shiny as it does on the car lot. I don't know if you know that or not. But it just looked all shiny and new. And they had the shiny tire stuff on there. And you open that door and that new car smell hits you and then we started seeing them everywhere and this guy he was giving us a special rebate and all this stuff and I was like it don't matter it's still an expensive car he said but it must be a sign we're seeing them everywhere it's just been omen from God and well, sometimes we'll do this and think oh the Lord wants me to do it, it no you need to be very careful okay if God is leading you to do something I think that you're going to know beyond a shadow of a doubt there should be peace in your life there should be peace not discord. And so here he says, oh, if anybody asks, to tell them the Lord needs it. That was their authority. That was their authority. And church, I'm telling you, if God is leading you to do something, that is your authority. You have the full authority to do whatever God is leading you to do. But don't use it for your own agenda. The name of the Lord is not to be used so you can get what you want, to do what you want. It's not to be used that way. Instead, it's used to further His will. Here's what happens. This is verse 32. So those who were sent left, talking about these two, and they found it just as he had told them. Now, if I was these disciples, I would be just in awe. Like, man, I can't believe it. There's the donkey. It was just like he said. As they were untying the young donkey, imagine somebody getting in your car. Its owner said to them, why are you untying the donkey? And they said, the Lord needs it. The Lord needs it. And that was just magically okay. The Lord needs it. And these people were perfectly okay with that. Did they know who the Lord was? I do not know. Did they know that Jesus was getting ready to ride into uh, Jerusalem? I do not know. Do they, did they know that they were going to get their donkey back? I don't know that either. Like, if somebody wants to borrow one of my vehicles, I'm kind of wanting an idea of, okay, where they're going, when they're coming back, is it going to have fuel in it when they come back, what time I can expect them to come back. Like, I want to know these things. It's the same thing my parents did whenever I first started driving. Okay, where are you going? All right, you got gas? Yeah, you got my, Yeah, got all that. All right, when, when are you coming back? It's not that I just went out whenever I wanted to. There was some responsibility there. Could you imagine somebody else coming up and going, just getting in your car and like, wait a minute, what are you doing? It's okay, the Lord needs it. It's okay, the Lord needs it. And they just, that's it. We don't hear any of this other interaction. They just back off. I think it's just pretty amazing. And it happened just, just exactly the way that the Lord had said. But again, we need to be very careful that we don't use the name of the Lord for our own agenda. Be very cautious when you use the name of the Lord. Now, if the Lord's leading you, if He's leading you to do something, then I encourage you to do it, whatever that is. And it may seem far-fetched. Does it just seem far-fetched to go get somebody's donkey you don't even know of? Hey, all you got to do is just ride over across the state line. You're going to see a donkey tied up there. Just go grab it and bring it back to me. Wait, if anybody asks, just tell them the Lord needs it. And the disciples did this without any question. They went. And the only thing that the Bible tells us here is that they went and they found it just as Jesus had told them. It's pretty remarkable, isn't it? And I think that if the Lord is leading us and guiding us, 
we're going to see remarkable things in our life too. We're going to see prayers answered. We're going to see us, even ourselves, behaving differently than what we really want to. We're going to see some miracles in our life, and just as they did here. So they go and they find this donkey, and they bring it back to Jesus. This is verse 35. So then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their robes on the donkey, they helped Jesus get on it. As he was going along, they were spreading their robes on the road. So at this point, Jesus' fame has, has grown, and there's more people involved in here now. So whenever they get back with this donkey, there's no conversation. I mean, we don't see them going to Peter's like, Peter, you're not going to believe it. The donkey was just as Jesus. I mean, we don't see any of that conversation. I don't think they were really surprised. I don't... I mean, you just think of the things that they had seen. Right prior to this, they saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. Is that not awesome? They, they saw this. They saw a dead man walk out of the grave. They saw a little girl who was dead, raised back to life. They saw a woman who had this blood disorder all of her life, like so much, spent all of her resources for this disease. They saw her healed. They went with Jesus to this wedding and they saw this water turned into wine. They, they heard Jesus calm the storm just by saying, peace be still. They saw Jesus walking on water and it so captivated Peter he said let me join you and Peter walked on water with Jesus he sank later on but he still walked on water with Jesus so when he told them hey you're going to find this donkey and if anybody asks us tell them hey the Lord needs it I don't think they were really surprised it's in the scriptures for us today but I don't think they were really surprised because they had seen so many miracles and I don't know maybe if you've seen an act of God in your life but this particular week I've seen God do so many things through prayer, how he's touched. Church, Jesus is still saving lives today, saving their souls. He is still raising the dead to life. He is still healing. He is still leading people. Is he leading you? And some of you, you really struggle with this because you don't know if Jesus is leading you or not. How, how do I know? Well, look at what they did here. So the disciples, when they brought this back, they threw their robes on the donkey. And this was a sign of royalty. And then you see later on that these, all these other people, they're spreading their, these robes, these coats, they're spreading along the road. So I went to our coat rack just to kind of give a little light. So this is something that they did, is that they just took it, their coats, and they spread them out. Now this is more than just a common courtesy. Like if you were to take a, a, a you know, a, a coat or whatever and spread over a mud puddle so a lady wouldn't have to step in mud. This was more than that. This was a sign of recognizing royalty. We only see it one other time in the Bible, at least that, that I found, that uh, in Kings, when uh, this king, uh, he, was, he was wicked too, but the people still were recognizing him uh, as a leader. And as he was traveling, they were spreading the roads. They were paving the way. And some people spread their coats out. And what some others did, and they got some bigger than others, what some people did, they didn't use this. They spread palm branches out. They spread palm branches out. Something like this. And so Jesus walking, I'm sorry, riding this donkey while people did this. Spread out before him. Paving the way. And they were recognizing Jesus as not just somebody, but as royalty, as king. Could you imagine witnessing this? Jesus on this donkey. This road being paved with coats, with palm branches. It's known as Palm Sunday. Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Do you imagine what a sight that would have been? See, people were gathering together at Jerusalem for the Passover. This was a very special meal, and it's because of what took place in the Old Testament. And, and they were to do this every year. And so, again, everybody was going to Jerusalem for this Passover. So there were tons of people, gobs of people. And they were recognizing Jesus 
as their king, as royalty. But see, they already had a king. They were living under Roman rule, but Israel was under Roman rule. The nation of Israel was under Roman rule. In verse 36, as he was going along, as he was going along, they were spreading their robes on the road. Now, one thing that I think that is key here is, is that they didn't just, they didn't just take their coats and just, here you go, Jesus. Said that they were spreading. Now, I know that you know how to spread out like for covers or whatever, like for your bed. I believe that they were doing it with caution, spreading it out. They were recognizing Jesus as Lord. They were recognizing Jesus as King. And they spread this out, spread this road, cover the road as they're recognizing as royalty. But they did something else. So verse 37. Now as he came near the path down the Mount of Olives, and the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles that they had seen. The king who comes in the name of the Lord is the blessed one. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. I like what Matthew says. Matthew says they cried out, Hosanna. 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 Blessed the one who comes in the name of the Lord. They were crying this out. They were claiming Jesus as Lord, they were claiming him as king. King. And they spread this out. This was their testimony. This was their witness. They participated in. It wasn't a parade that we might think of today. It was Jesus' grand entry into Jerusalem. This is what kicked off Holy Week. This is what kicks off the events of Easter. Was Jesus' entry. And he's greeted by this unbelievable reception where people are taking their coats off, laying them out on the road. And he's coming in on a donkey, a young donkey, a virgin donkey, a one that had not been rode yet. He was the first one. And they're crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna. And you see that the crowd of the people, they, it grew. It grew. This is why I wanted to have the lights off today. It's because sometimes we will feed off of other people instead of our own relationship with Jesus. See, sometimes we'll do it to advance our relationship with Jesus. Or sometimes we'll do it and it'll hinder us. Well, so-and-so ain't doing this. Well, so-and-so's doing that. It's about you. If you were present with Jesus that day, if you were on the roadside that day, what would you do with your coat? What, what would you do with your coat? Would you, would you have took it off? Would you have laid it out? Would you have cried out, Hosanna? Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Would you recognize Jesus as King of kings and Lord of lords, or would you not have? They did, but the crowd grew. The crowd grew, and it said that the whole crowd. We're not sure how many people was here, but it's believed that it was thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people that were gathered together. Not just at Jerusalem, but also around this road to welcome Jesus in. Recognizing him as the king, the new king, the king of Israel. The one who was going to free them from Roman rule. The one who was going to establish by na the nation of Israel together as a unity. And here he is coming in and riding on a donkey. And they spread out their coats and they cried out, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And you think at this time that everybody would be happy. And I don't know if you came across this or not, but there's always going to be somebody to criticize you and your relationship with Jesus. They're going to criticize you. They're going to criticize your church. They're going to criticize your Bible. They're going to criticize you. Not everybody's happy. Look at verse 39. It says, Some of the Pharisees from the crowd, and these were the people who thought they were it. They thought they were the closest to God, the Pharisees. So some of the Pharisees from the crowd told him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if they were to keep silent, the stones would cry out. The stones would cry out. Can you imagine all this multitude would cry out and they're crying out how loud that would have been? We have, we have four girls in our house and uh, one of our girls has a birthday. As a matter of fact, today's her birthday and she had some friends over and so there were six little girls in our house and if you could imagine, you know, your house having four little girls and you having six little girls there, can you imagine just the noise that comes through? Like whenever they're going across the hallway it sounds like a herd of elephants like it, it's it's 
so, and they're not even doing anything. It's just little girls being loud, and they're giggly, and it's very sweet. And you're like, man, could you imagine how it would have sounded when you had thousands upon thousands of people crying out, Hosanna? Hosanna how, what kind of chaos that would have been? I mean, how many people crying that out? How loud? What captivated his attention? And these Pharisees were in the background, and they were not happy. And he, they told Jesus, hey, you need to rebuke your disciples, your followers. He said, nope. Nope. Because if they were to keep silent, the stones would cry out. Now, I like this. Because I think that he bum-fuzzled the Pharisees. Because I've looked at many rocks in my life. I've thrown many a rock. I have skipped many a rock. And I've never heard a rock cry. Could you imagine if we don't recognize Jesus as king? If we don't cry out and recognize him as king of kings and lord of lords, that in your place a rock would cry out? When this hit me, I was like, man, I do not want a rock to take my place. Because a rock is just a rock. But we, we mean something to God. We mean something. Now, he created the rocks. He created this world. I, I get that. But John 3, 16 tells us how much he loves us. He cares about us. He cares about you. God forbid that we should allow a rock to take our praise. We, today, we need to recognize Jesus as King of kings and Lord of lords. This is what kicked off the Holy Week, this is what kicks off all these events of Easter, which is grand entry into the And the people crying out, Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And we know that later on, they changed their mind. There was a great crowd that gathered, and instead of crying, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, they started crying out, crucify him, crucify him. They were challenged, which one do you want? Do you want me to free Jesus or Barabbas? And they said, give us Barabbas. Well, then what do you want me to do with Jesus? Crucify him. Crucify him. And they did. They did. See, they flip-flopped. Often what we do. See, we love Jesus when everything's going good in our life. We love him. For, oh, he's so good. God is so good. Bless you. God is so good. There's been many a times that I left church just thinking, man, that was awesome. God showed up in a great way, and somebody will cut off in front of me. I'm going to go, God, where are you at? Like, what? They need Jesus. I'm going to pray for you. And then God just kind of slaps me and says, like, uh, what about you? <laughs> All right, guilty. I told you, we don't always get it right. <laughs> we don't always get it right. We're going to mess up. And the Israel lights, they messed up. And if you look through church history, you're going to see that they messed up a lot. They were all about God and walking with God. Everything was good. And then they got down on the dumps and they got taken captive again. And then they went back up to the mountain. Up. Oh, God is good. He freed us. Now we have our, no enemies. We're great. We have taken over our enemies. And then they forgot about God and started worshiping other idols. And then it was just, just up and down and up and down and up and down. A lot like what we do. Nothing's changed. So I think it comes down to this one question that we need to answer. We kind of need to nail down in our life. Is Jesus, is Jesus who he says he is? Is he? I'm not asking if you're saved. I'm not asking if you're lost. I'm asking, is Jesus the Son of God? Is he the King of kings and Lord of lords, or is he not? Which is he? See, this is where the crowd can't help you. You must answer this for yourself. Is Jesus who he says he is? Because if he is, this means that your life doesn't matter. Your mistakes doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is that Jesus is who he says he is. So then that means I need to do what the Bible says in regards to Jesus. Yes. See, if Jesus is indeed who he says he is, then we're are removing ourselves from the equation. It's all about Jesus. And church, that is what is key. See, they miss this. They miss this. This is why they were flip-flopping. See, I don't think that Jesus is looking for perfect people. I don't think that Jesus is looking for people who can come to 
church on Sunday and just live perfectly all throughout the week. I don't think that's what he's looking for. I think that he's looking for people that'll just be faithful. That'll recognize him as king and just walk with him. Allow him to lead him. Allow him to guide him. Just walk with him. Doesn't mean you're always going to get it right. And the only way that I can compare this to is if you have kids. Because I love my kids. I, I, I love them so much. And they don't always get it right. They get things wrong. Sometimes they get things a lot wrong. And other times they get a little, a little bit wrong. But I love my kids. And even when they mess up, and even when they do wrong, they're still my kids. And I wouldn't trade them for nothing. And you probably feel the same way about yours. And I think this is the way that God feels about us. We're his kids. And the way that we become his kids is recognize that Jesus Christ is Lord, Lord of our life. None of this has anything to do with you living a perfect life. None of this has anything to do with your mess-ups. It's just that your sins are forgiven. You've been washed by the blood. Is Jesus who he says he is? Because he came, he died, and he rose again that you may have life. He proved that he was, he had power over death, hell, and the grave. He proved that he was the Son of God. Many other people have come claiming that they were the Messiah, claiming that they were the pathway to God, and they all died and they're still graveyard dead, but not Jesus. This is why Jesus is so important to the story, because he is the story. He is the story. Church, it comes down to this. Is Jesus who he says he is? If he is, then it's time that we recognize him as King of kings and Lord of lords. Just as the people, they took off their coats and they laid it out before the Lord as he traveled. And I'm not saying you need to take your coat off, but you need to recognize in him as King of kings and Lord of lords, King of your life, the Lord of your life. Doesn't mean you're always going to get it right, just as I was talking about with my kids. Doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect because you're not. But it does mean that you're walking with the Savior. You're walking with Him. And as you walk with Him, we worship Him. That no rock's going to get the praise that you ought to give out. You're going to praise Him. You're not always going to get it right. But you're going to go for it. You're not always going to have the right words to say. But you're going to worship Him. It's called faithfulness. And being faithful, all that that means is, is that we just don't quit. We don't quit. We be faithful. Is Jesus Christ the Lord of your life or is he not? Maybe it's time that you just nail this down to where you would be faithful. Quit being so hard on yourself for all the times that, that you mess up and just say, Jesus, just be the Lord of my life. I don't know about you, but the kind of the way that I, I experience it, the kind of the way that I feel this is, is that I'm still not perfect, but I'm so much closer than what I was yesterday. I, I, I still mess up. I, I'm your pastor, and I still mess up, but I'm definitely closer than I was last year. I'm walking closer with the Father than what I was. You? Is he King of kings and Lord of lords? Is he? Because if he is, then he needs to be the Lord of our life. That means that he's the leader. He's the one who's leading us and guiding us. Well, then if he's not, well, then it doesn't matter. But we know that he is. We already know what happens later on this week as he, got, he went uh, and died. He was beaten and he, and he died. He was buried in a tomb. He was sealed up. Guards were placed there so nobody could steal his body. And he rose from the dead. The disciples witnessed it. Mary witnessed it. We see that later on that there was many other witnesses that saw the risen Savior. They saw Jesus. We know that Thomas, he, he doubted it, but yet he believed. And Jesus said this, Thomas, you believe because you have seen. But blessed are those who believe and have not seen. Church, he's talking about us. Us. Is Jesus King of kings and Lord of the Lord, or is he not? Which one is he? Because if he is, then it's time to make him the Lord of your life. Maybe you're here today and you're like, man, I've already made him the Lord of my life. Yes, you may have, maybe you did. Maybe you've done that. Maybe you keep beating yourself up because you are just 
Maybe if I could just keep falling or failing. To the people that day, they laid their coats out. They laid them out. Hosanna. Hosanna had their palm branches waving it. Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. Crying out. And then later on, they were crying out, crucify him, crucify him. See, they, they got it wrong too. And you're going to see that as we go on, you're going to see some people, they, they went back that, oh man, we messed up. True that this was the Son of God. We messed up. One was a Roman soldier. He said, sure that this was the Son of God. Church, you're not always going to get it right. I think the key is, is that you just make him Lord. Allow him to lead you. Allow him to guide you. And I think a lot of the time we don't even know what that means. I think it starts with being faithful. He'll give us instruction later on. <laughs> See, I struggled with this for many years. Like, man, what does God want me to do? What does he want me to do? And I had this old-timey preacher get up in my face with his 80-year-old fingers that felt like they were that long and right in my face. And he said, and you don't need to know. When God wants you to do something, He's going to make it so obvious you'll have no choice but to do it. He told me, He said, go do it. And I just kept looking at Him. He went, no, go do it. I went, yes, sir. So I, I got up. He said, no, wait a minute. Let me pray for you. So we was in this little bitty office, and he, he prayed for me. We were so close to this tiny desk, and he was sitting right across from me like I could smell his coffee breath. And he prayed for me that day, and it forever changed my life. And all he was trying to get me to do, Jesus, just leave me and guide me. Take my coat off me. Lord, just leave me and guide me. Just leave me and guide me. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. God, just lead me and guide me. I'm not always going to get it right. But I'm going to fight for it. There's times I'm going to mess up. But I'm going to die trying. I'm not going to be able to get to the end of my life and not have something. Is he the Lord of your life, or is he not? Church, you've got to nail that down. Because if Jesus is who he says he is, he came and he died for you. It's time for him to be the Lord of your life. So just as he led those disciples, and just as he led those, all those disciples up to the Mount of Olives, and then he led two of them just to go a little bit further, he gave them further instruction. I think that he's going to give some of us some further instruction. I think to going to lead us corporately together but I think that he may be leading you and maybe to go in a specific area or maybe a specific direction in your life well I'm going to lead you there oh but I I don't know I don't know what it's like <laughs> neither did these disciples hey you're going to go find a donkey if anybody asks just say the Lord needs it and they just went okay okay and so they take off and they go get another man's donkey it's okay uh, the Lord needs it and the owner just surrenders it up. I think the surrender is the key, church. Not that you get it right. But you just surrender and say, okay, God, whatever you want. Whatever you want. Be the Lord of my life. I give it to you. Church, have you done that? I'm not asking this. I'm not asking if you're lost. I'm not asking if you're saved. I'm just saying, that have you made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? Because it's time that he is number one. As this kicks off this Passion Week, these events surrounding Easter, this is known as Palm Sunday, in which they were recognized as Jesus Christ as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Hosanna. Hosanna. Bless is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. So it's just time that we nail that down. They were flip-flopping. I think it's time that, that we nail that down. If Jesus is who he says he is, then we need to nail that down. And walk with him. Now let's back up and say what we did at the very beginning. Do you have a relationship with Jesus? Do you? Because see, some of you are a hardcore yes. Yes, I do. I, I made that profession a long time ago. I do. That's great. Now is he leading you? Others of you, you're really struggling about whether or not, I mean, you're, you're wrestling with about whether or not that you have done that or not it's time to nail that down yes I've recognized that Jesus Christ as my Savior he's the King of Kings and Lord of Lords I, I've done that 
Others of you, you're unsure if you've done that or not. Now it comes to the point that you need to ask yourself, okay, am I saved or not? And nail that down. We're not asking for you to be perfect. Jesus wasn't asking anybody to be perfect. But he was asking them to follow him. Follow his leadership. Follow his guidance. Is Jesus Christ the Lord of your life or is he not? Is Jesus who he says he is? Then if he is, we know it to be true. So then it's time to nail that down. I don't know where you're at right now in your walk with God. I don't know where, how much Jesus is a part of your life or not. But the easy way, the one true way to tell is who it is that's actually leading you. Is it yourself, your own desires, your own ambitions? Or is it Jesus? Remember, we said that we can enjoy life, we can enjoy things uh, here. And I think, that, I think that God cares about whatever we care about. I just think he wants to have a relationship with us and be included in it. Is he the Lord of your life or is he not? I'm going to ask you a point blank question. As we kick off this Holy Week in this series, we're talking about Easter, talking about the entry, talking about the cross, the resurrection, talking about the witnesses after. As we, as we talk about these things this month, I want you to nail this down. Are you saved or not? Nail that down. It can't be about anybody else. It can't be about the crowd. It can only be about you and Jesus. That's it. You and Jesus. And it's time to nail that down. If you're here today and you have uncertainty, nail that down. Yes, I'm making Jesus Lord of my life. Yes, I know that he died and rose again for me that I may have life so that my sins could be forgiven. That's great. Let's recognize him as King of kings and Lord of the Lord. Accept him as our Savior. And walk with him. Others of you, you, you are saved. But it's like you and Jesus are button heads. He's trying to lead you and to do things. And you're just bucking. You're not being like these other two disciples. He's trying to lead you to a certain direction, and you're just bucking. Maybe you thought that you're not worthy or you're not qualified. And I don't know what these disciples thought when he told them, hey, why don't you go untie that donkey that you're going to find in the city and bring it back to me. Oh, yeah, and if anybody asks, just tell them that, you know, the Lord needs it. And it may sound something so ridiculous like that, that he's trying to lead you, and you're just, you're bucking on it. Is he the Lord or is he not? Is he the Lord or is he not? So this is what it comes down to. See, if Jesus Christ is King and Kings and Lord of Lords, then it's time for you to nail that down and say, you know what, I need to nail this down. I need to be saved. For others of you, you're already saved, but he's trying to give you further instruction in your life and you're bucking on it. It's time to nail that down and say, okay, God, I give it to you. Here, here's my coat. I give it to you. I give it to you. So I don't know what it is, where you're at in your life right now, but it's one or the other. One or the other. Either we're saved or we're not. Or he's leading us or not. It's one or the other. Church, we've got to nail that down. We have to nail that down. So I don't know right now where you're at in your walk with God or what he might be speaking to you out of this today, but it's time that Jesus is recognized in your life as King of kings and Lord of lords. Would you take a moment and pray with me? Father, we love you and thank you for all that you do for us. And we thank you, Father, for your word. And we know that these events surrounding by Easter, they took place such a long time ago but it's still so relevant today, and it means so much today. And I pray right now, God, that through the power of your Holy Spirit, that we wouldn't get caught up in the moment, wouldn't get caught up in recognizing with other people, but instead we would be caught up in our relationship with you, what kind of relationship we have with Jesus. And right now, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just search us out, reveal yourself unto us, that we may know how to respond to your word, in your call. You call me As you continue to pray, the there's some of you here today, and it's time to nail that down. These lights are right in my eyes, so I can't even see you. So it's just between you and Jesus. Is Jesus the Lord of your life, or is he not? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Like, do you have that nailed down? 
that yes he is some of you here today and you're like yes he is Lord of my, I've already recognized that Jesus Christ is my Savior I've done that would you take a moment and pray for someone that hasn't as you pray for those that may be lost in your life there may be somebody here to say you know what I need to nail that down I've never accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior or I'm unsure let's nail that down and I'm asking I'm asking you right now to call out on God right now and ask Him to save you. That we talk about Jesus' triumphal entry. He's getting ready to go to the cross and die. But we know that He's going to go in that tomb and He's going to raise up three days later. And because of that, He overcame sin. He became sin that we might be free. He died for you. John 3.16 tells us that. He loves you. That's the reason why God gave us His Son. He loves you. He wants a relationship with you and lead you just as he did these disciples. Would you take a moment right now and nail that down? If that's you today, you've got that question. You've got that question. And it's time to nail that down. Would you right now just call out? Call out to God right now. Right now, without hesitation. Say, God, save me. I need to be saved from my sins. I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior for my sins I believe he died and rose again so please save me for my sins I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior now take my life and make me brand new nobody's looking around if you prayed that prayer to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior then I welcome you into God's family and if you have questions about that then I encourage you to see me right after church I'm going to be right up here up front you see me right after church. And we'll talk further. But we got to talk about something else. Because some of you here today, I think Jesus is trying to nudge you. He's trying to lead you. And you're almost like a cat trying to take a bath and just, I mean, you're just fighting and kicking and screaming. And he's trying to nudge you. He's trying to get you out of your comfort zone. He, he's trying to get you to go in a certain direction. He's trying to maybe get you to do something maybe you haven't done before, maybe a little bit new. It sounds crazy, and I'm sure it sounded crazy to these two disciples when he told them to go get this donkey, this young donkey, but they did it. If you're here today, and he's trying to lead you, he's trying to guide you to do something else, and it may be in your, it may be in your comfort zone, it may be out of your comfort zone, but he's trying to lead you. Would you just say, you know what, Jesus, you are the Lord of my life. Here's my coat. I give it to you. Just as they did. Would you let him to lead you and to guide you? I want to pray for you. If you feel like God is leading you this morning to do something, would you just raise your hand and say, hey, I think God's leading me to do something. Would you pray for me? I just want to have the opportunity to pray for you. Nobody's looking around. I just want to pray for you. If you feel like God's leading you in a certain direction, I might, might just pray for you. Just raise your hand and say, all right, just pray for me. Just pray for me. God, I pray that you'd be with those that you're speaking to, that you would just take them a little bit further. <laughs> it says that the here we read that you took these two disciples. Yeah, everybody was with them, but these two disciples, they needed further instruction. You had special things for them to do. And God, I pray for all those that you're leading right now, God, that we would surrender. As we've made you the Lord of our life, recognize you as King of kings and Lord of lords, God, that you would lead us and guide us in all that we say and all that we do. God, that we might walk with you into the valley of shadow of death. Whether we fully recognize what's going on or whether we fully understand, I don't think it really matters. I think what matters is that we're just walking with you. God, I don't think that the, the mess-ups really matter, but that we're walking with you, that we're faithful. Sometimes, God, we get it wrong a lot. Help us as we walk with you. Help us, Father, as we walk with you. As you continue to pray, I want to pray for one more group of people. Maybe you've got somebody on your heart that maybe they need Jesus. Maybe they're lost. They don't have a relationship with the Father. We're going to pray for those. Right now, would you just give those names to God? We're going to pray for those together. But right now, would you just call out to God and say, God, I need you to save so-and-so. Give those names to God right now. We're going to pray corporately together. Who is it that needs Jesus? Who is it that needs to be saved? We're going to pray for them. Right now, would you just lift those names up? Just lift those names up right now. Who needs to be saved? 
Hit those names up. Let's pray for them together. God, we love you and we thank you for hearing our prayers. And right now, God, you, these names are going up. These names are going up. And as you've heard those names, Father, we ask, Father, that you would save them. And help us, God, that we might do our part. That we might invite them to church. That we might be able to point them to a certain scripture. We might be able to invite them to Easter. Help us, God, that we might even be a light to them at work or at home or maybe your neighbor. God, just help us to be a light. That when people see us, they can see past our flaws. They can just see Jesus. They can see past our mistakes. They just see Jesus. God, help us that our, even our conversations, even our work ethic, we show people that we have a relationship with the Father. God, may you save these people that are heavy upon our hearts, that they may be saved. Prepare their hearts to hear word from you. May we be a witness. God, we thank you for the, your word and how it speaks. God, we thank you for answered prayers and how you've moved and worked on our behalf. And we're thankful, Father, that you're not done yet. So use us, God. As you took those two disciples a little bit further, God, we pray that as we make you the Lord of our life, as we recognize you as King of kings and Lord of lords, God, I pray that you would bless our efforts, that we'd be a witness for you regardless of where we go. And that as we walk with you, God, you just keep taking us a little further, a little further, that we may have a closer walk with you, and that whenever people see us, they see Jesus. In his powerful name we pray. Amen. Would you take a moment and give God some awesome praise, God. I love you.